Hello everybody and welcome to this afternoon's session on the Make for Tomorrow programme. Um, my name is Lucy. I'm very sorry if you've been to these sessions before and you've heard me say this a million times, but I will say it again, um, especially for those who haven't been here before. So um, we, you are in a session on the Make for Tomorrow programme, which is a really exciting online participatory arts programme for people across Sussex Partnership Mental Health Trust. Um, so my name is Lucy. I work for the Trust. I'm the Arts and Health Lead. So our arts and health program is called make your mark and this program make for tomorrow is really about finding uh, moments in our week where we can come together and connect through um through the arts and through creativity to bring a bit of hope and joy and and just share together you know it's challenging times stressful times and it's really important to find ways to I don't know, connect with a bit of purpose and with each other in our in our days. So um, we've got a really exciting session this afternoon. But before uh, we get into that, I just want to quickly um, give a, a very important nod to um, our partners on this project. So it's not just the Trust who's doing this. We're doing it in partnership with two fantastic arts organisations, one of which is Arts Over Borders. And I'll introduce you to Liam in a minute and he can tell you a little bit more about them. But they are they uh, programme amazing and interesting and immersive um, events um, around literature and performance in unusual places. And then our other arts partner is um, Hospital Rooms. And if you've not come across them, do check them out online. They're fab. They work with visual artists and they are all about transforming uh, clinical spaces to make them more I don't know, just more beautiful and more interesting places to be. Um, so they've been curating the visual arts part of our programme. Um, and then we've also got our brilliant uh, tech partner, COGAP. So they are like the rocket fuel in all of this. They press all the right buttons, get all the technology set up. I am not a very technical person, so I know that I'm not alone in being hugely grateful for all the work that they do on the programme. So it's enough from me. I'm going to hand you over to Liam from Arts Over Borders, and he will introduce these two fantastic, extraordinary women who are going to be having a chat this afternoon. Oh, and just to say, this is interactive. We would love to hear from you. So do, as we go along through the afternoon, do, if you've got any questions, any comments, do type your question into the Q&A box and, um, and, and Alex will hopefully get to them all. But yeah, enjoy the afternoon and I'll see you at the end. All right, that's bye bye from me. Thank you, Lucy. Um, good afternoon and hello, everyone. Um, just by way of introduction, if you haven't watched one of the earlier conversations, uh, I work with my colleagues, Sean and Arts Over Borders, and we curate arts festival individual events with a particular focus on place, on landscape, uh, on creating site specific unique events. So our role in Make for Tomorrow is to curate a series of conversations with artists and performers in which they explore not just the positive positives in their life and work, but the challenges they've faced and how they've coped with and how they've managed those challenges. So I'm delighted today to welcome Marion Keyes for, for this conversation. We're really, really grateful to Marion for accepting our invitation. And Marion is going to be in conversation with Alex Clark. Alex is a journalist and editor. Uh, she writes for The Guardian, The Observer, and The Times Literary Supplement. She's presented uh, Open Book and Front Row in Radio 4, and she hosts the Vintage Podcast on Books. And she's also been in the judging panel for a number of prizes and awards, including the Booker Prize. So um, our thanks to Alex for agreeing to chair today. So to begin with, um, Alex is going to say a few words about Marion. That will then lead into the conversation. So um, I hope you enjoy it. And, and over to you, Alex. Hey, thank you so much, Liam and Lucy and everybody who's made this possible. And thank you all for coming. And just to reiterate, type your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to many, uh, as many as we can. And I have been in conversation with Marion a few times and I know that questions come thick and fast, don't they, Marion? <laughs> so uh, we will, and, and she loves to answer them. I think I can speak on her behalf there, but what an honour and a pleasure it is for us all to have Marion here. You will know her, of course, from her novels. I think there are now 16 of them, including Watermelon, Rachel's Holiday, and most recently Grown Ups, also for her non-fiction books. And of course, for her exceptionally warm, wise and witty presence in the public eye, including on Twitter and also in amazing campaigns such as the Repeal the Eighth campaign in Ireland and the campaign against direct provision. Um, but I'm not going to go on forever because you want to hear from Marion. Marion, I'm just going to start by asking you, well, your inbox gets inundated with requests to chat to people. And I know you always do as many as you can. But I wondered why you're here this afternoon. Hi, hi, Alex, and hi, everyone who's um, joining us this afternoon. I am so delighted and excited about this. 
Um, I felt, I mean, I do get asked to do a lot. And um, I just felt that in a way, because the last six months have been so strange and so hard for everyone, like including myself, that it would be nice to have um, a discussion about the ways that like writing or painting or baking um, can help us. You know, a lot of us have too much time at the moment. Um, and too much time is a difficult thing if you suffer from anxiety um, or catastrophic thinking, which is, hello, me. Um, and yeah. just to realize that, like, there are ways that we can help ourselves, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be like those incredibly monetizable ways. Like, you know, at the beginning, people were like, I'm going to learn conversational Korean or, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to do an online um barrister course you know there was an awful lot of it because it's we live in such an awful capitalist society that we feel like any spare second we should have we have we should use it to try and expand our skill set and and often thinking like that and i think let's forget about all of that none of us are able for anything too taxing uh, at the moment because the anxiety has taken an awful lot of our headspace and an awful lot of our energy but we can kind of we can help ourselves and enjoy ourselves with lesser activity. I don't mean lesser, but not monetizable in the same way, you know, like whatever, upcycling furniture or writing a diary, trying to put like a comic spin on, on what we're living through. So, yeah, I thought it would be a good way, a kind of um, a proactive way to use art to to help ourselves to this very very weird time you're absolutely right marion because at the beginning i mean obviously people were in extremely acute situations but as you say we also did have these unexpected hiatuses in our time and it was this idea that doing something had to be something by which we measured a kind of success wasn't it you know not just a way to actually keep ourselves together keep ourselves feeling happy and comforted and calm and productive, but we actually had to have a goal that we met. And in general, creativity just doesn't have to be that, does it? Not at all. I mean, yeah, there was a tweet right at the beginning of the pandemic by some dreadful man who said, well, if you don't use this pandemic time to write that novel you've always been talking about, it doesn't mean that you are short of time, it just means that you are lazy. And it's like, for the love of God, do you know, this is not, these are not normal times. Mm -hmm. Our head isn't working in the normal way. Um, our imagination has shut down um, and there is a reason for that. Um, and th th there is this awful pervasive attitude that everything we do with every second of our time has to be with the goal of making money. And mm -hmm. I mean, I see it, especially in our young people and, and the pressures that are put on them like nothing can be done just to enjoy yourself like you can't go out for a swim in the sea just to enjoy yourself it's got to be content for Instagram or it's got to be about like trying to get sponsored by by swimwear makers do you know everything they've been trained to think that everything has to be about making money and it absolutely doesn't you know, our souls and our emotions and our, our internal selves deserve nice things and nice pastimes. And, you know, and we've really lost the ability to play. And I think, you know, like I paint pictures, which are really, really bad, but I don't care because I enjoy myself. And, and I never have that pressure of thinking, is this good enough to sell? Because I know they're not. You know, and it takes all that pressure off me. And I have such a wonderful time because it's for me and it's only for me. And, you know, we deserve those things um, mm -hmm. just for our own souls. And I think we've forgotten that, you know, that we can we can get up in the morning and we can write a diary that entertains us or that makes us feel safer in ourselves or just more connected to ourselves. And that that is enough in itself, you know, no one need ever see it. Marion, you've made me feel so much better about my broad beans now, because 
there were no things that were loved and nurtured more carefully than those baked beans. And indeed, I built them wigwams and I nourished their soil. And essentially, you could have entered them into a competition for the world's smallest broad beans and also the smallest yield. So the kind of five micro beans that I ended up with, you're saying were not a failure. I am indeed a gardener in the making. You are absolutely a gardener in the making. You know, like I can, that thing of growing something from a little seed, you know, I'm a city person. I've always been a city person. I've never had that experience. And I can see the thrill of it. Um, like we have some wild mint grown in our north facing swamp like garden and the thrill of like thinking, oh, we need mint for this recipe. Thinking, Jesus Christ, hold on. It's actually out there. No, Alex, your five micro broad beans are yeah. a miracle. Like truly, mm. you planted them, you, you gave them shelter, you know, and would they ever have grown if you hadn't loved them? Like, seriously, I would be really proud. I think yeah. anything growing from the ground is like, oh my God, it's, it's witchcraft almost. I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna take that and run with it. Marion, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about your books and, and actually to apply something that you've, you've said, you've been saying there. When you started to write, your life was not in the kind of place that somebody would have said, okay, here's a good place for somebody to sit down, embark on an entire new career, a career that's very difficult to get into. I mean, your life was kind of in crisis when you began to write, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And, and I'm very comfortable talking about this because I feel there's nothing to be ashamed of, really. Like I started writing short stories in the autumn of, 1993 and I didn't know it at the time but I was in my final sort of crash and burn in alcoholic drinking I just turned 30 and I've often said this like my glittering future was far behind me like I was you know I had been clever at school and I'd gone to university and I'd got a degree in law and you know, my poor parents thought I would go on and be a solicitor and I could do their wills and, you know, sell their house for them and that sort of thing. And because I'd always been dogged by low self-esteem, I felt, I just, I don't know, I just felt I wouldn't prosper in that world. Mm -hmm. And instead I went to London, I got a job as a waitress. I had a fabulous time for a while. Um, I had kind of outrun myself for a while. Then my drinking picked up speed again and yeah so by the time I started writing my short stories I was four months away from rehab and that happened in January of 1994 and I spent six weeks in that place and like I honestly thought when I was going in there that I suffered from depression and that I didn't have a problem with alcohol that it was just if my if you if you had my life and my problems you drink too anyway so I came out I realized actually that the gig the gig was up I was an alcoholic and I had to stop and like I was 30 which I felt was kind of very very young to have to stop and I thought like I will never I'll never have another boyfriend because you know I needed to be drunk in order to talk to men and I thought like I thought my life was over and I was and I was really quite annoyed about that, but I started writing again and it was, the you know, a lot had changed in that six weeks in that like I had always been very defeatist and I thought I'm going to write these stories and I'll see what happens. And I wrote for my own entertainment and I think it was the first time I had ever done something that kind of chimed with who I really was. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean no disrespect to my parents, but they were far more excited about my law degree than I ever was. And I felt I could, I could write these stories. I'm so sorry, that's my doorbell, um, th that weird sound. Somebody will deal with it. Don't worry. I say somebody, it's my husband. I make it sound like I have like, a, you know, a, a team of personal assistants. I don't. Anyway, so yeah, um, I was always defeatist. And uh, 
but this the short stories I thought I th you know I was I was shamefully proud of them you know I thought these are gassed you know I thought these are great like in retrospect they so weren't but it didn't matter because I had pride in something I had done mm. for like kind of I know it sounds awful to get to the age of 30 but like kind of for the first time ever and when I started, I, I kind of got myself into a situation where I had decided I would never write a novel and I ended up having to make a start. And I made a decision that I wasn't going to try and be like anyone else, that I was going to write the kind of novel that I wanted to read. And again, that sort of self-belief or that kind of decision to serve myself was, was, was rare for me. But it worked because I was I was enthusiastic about it. Like it was something I really wanted to do. Um, and I would really say that to anyone, like if you want to write, don't write for the market that you think is out there or don't try and be like the person you really admire. Find your own voice, be yourself because there is something incredibly resonant in authenticity, um, quirkiness, individuality that that has a huge appeal um rather than copying somebody else um so yeah I was myself for the first time and I didn't hate it Marianne, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people will I think you know writers everywhere people who want to kind of want to make something it doesn't have to be writing it could be anything will feel that there is that anxiety they'll listen to you and they may think but i don't know how to find that authenticity but i don't feel confident but i write something and i feel it's not working and i wonder if i really am the right person be, to be doing this but it's very important what you said there you did it for yourself you did it for your own entertainment not with the idea will this fail or succeed and do you think that's something in a way that everybody can develop if they're sort of patient enough to I do. I mean, I do. I do think it's hard. You know, if you read a lot and you love words and you love prose and you see how other people do it, it's hard if you find your own writing to be not as good. But that's, I mean, they, what did they say? Like comparisons are, comparisons are awful. Like they're the thief of joy for a start. Um, and I think, I think to keep asking yourself, would I read this? Do I like this? And then ask yourself, am I enjoying writing it? Mm. Because if you're enjoying writing it, it's job done. Like that's, that's the truth at the heart of all of this. That's why anyone does anything. It's for yourself. And it's to do something that you approve of. Um, even if you feel that in the outside world that it mightn't get, you know, the, the success that you would like for it. Measure your success differently. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. You know, if you like it, if it entertains you, if it makes you smile, if you read a couple of the sentences you wrote and you think, I love them, I love them together, or I really like this character I've created. She's a bit odd. She's a bit like me. You know, if you get those feelings, it is the most nourishing thing um pay attention to those feelings rather than comparing it to who's fabulous Maggie O'Farrell you know don't compare yourself to Maggie O'Farrell there's only <laughs> one Maggie O'Farrell you know well Maggie O'Farrell is Maggie O'Farrell and Marion Keys is Marion Keys and you out there are you out there is is the the issue isn't it and I mean I'm, I'm really interested in in the fact that you then obviously you did get published. Your early books were successful. They found readers. Um, you found a publisher who really wanted to stick with what you were doing and allow you to develop your talent as a writer. But there is something very key to the fact that that is not the end of anxiety, is it? That's not the end of worrying about whether you're doing a good job, whether where the next idea is gonna come from. And you never shy away from talking about that either. Yeah, again, it's, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a feelings person and I like talking about them and I like hearing other people's because it makes me feel better when people are honest. Yeah, you see, when I was drinking and 
and kind of up to that point, I had always thought that like once I got the outside part of my life fixed, like once I had a really lovely boyfriend, like the perfect man, like once I had a job where I was well paid and well respected and I got to go to Barcelona on business like four times a year, once I had that job, then once I had a really lovely fat, flat in Battersea or Chiswick or, you know, one of those sort of fabulous places. Once I had all those things and I could drive and I had a nippy little Audi TT, that nothing would ever hurt me again. You know, I thought the externals had to be in place before I felt okay. And, you know, those externals didn't work out, but I got, you know, um, like a thing that was much more me in that like my books got published. And I mean, I am forever grateful. Like I will always be so grateful for being published. And I would be so grateful to those people who have bought my books and who have stuck with me. But I remained essentially the same, which is, I was always a, ca a catastrophist, you know, and I was always a worrier. Um, and I was always a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I mean, you know, the way they talk about glass half full or glass half empty. I was the kind of person who didn't get a glass at all. Um, like that's, that was how sort of pessimistic I was. Yeah. And yes, I was so lucky that my first book was published and people were nice about it and then and then I came back to me and I thought now I have to do it again and I had always thought like everyone probably has one book in them and and I was really really afraid that I wouldn't be able to do it again and you know and that feeling has never gone away um and like I'm 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 writing a novel at the moment and those doubts are kind of there's they're still absolutely there like those voices in my head are as loud as they ever were um and the thing is at this stage I'm not so sure it's a bad thing I think it's a hard way to live if you've been program programmed to kind of criticize yourself but it makes me try very hard to do my best with anything that I write I really don't want to present something that's half baked or that it's a bit, you know, kind of casually done. Like, I, I really try my best. But the thing is, I've learned, and this has been painful, I can't legislate for other people's opinions. Like, people will read my books and they'll think, some people will think, that's lovely. And some people will think, oh, yeah, it's grand. And some people think, I absolutely hate it. Never, ever give me anything by her ever again. She makes my skin crawl. That voice of hers, everything is just terrible. And and if, you've been, if you're sensitive, I think, and as anyone creative is, and I suppose most people are, you know, those kind of criticisms can go very, very deep. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not really what you asked, but yeah, I've had to learn to to roll with that yes and I mean and it has got easier you know that is one of the great things about being around for long enough you know for getting older it's just I know that it's always painful like it's never ever ever nice it's not you know like to stumble across an opinion of yourself and you think oh am I that bad you know but it's not going to kill me I, you know I'm still here and and my I suppose my perspective has shifted you know and I really one of the, the favorite things I say you know is that uh, I'm not for everybody and everybody isn't for me you know that feeling of like live and let live in a very complex world it's it's helpful and you know, the world of, of novels and making art you know, whatever it is tv film music taste is so individual and so wide ranging we can in one person can like so many different things and different types of thing um but i'm interested in in you know, what you were saying right at the beginning about the strange times that we have been living through strange as a kind of euphemistic world really the horrible times um you are writing another novel now it's your job to keep your creative energy going and yet you're not immune to the things that everybody's been through um, in terms of your kind of concentration scattering and feeling worried about the big picture. How do you 
keep going in those circumstances when you think I've got to go to the desk today? Yeah, it's my job, as you say. And I, it, there has been a pattern to this. Like at the very beginning, I could do nothing. I mean, it was like the imaginative part of me had been taken out, um, like, like part of me had just been removed. And it was very, very frightening. Like I was trying to, to create small characters, kind of ancillary char characters to the book I'm writing. And I could come up with nothing. And mm -hmm. I subsequently discovered there's a reason for this. I mean, I find it so interesting. When we're terrified as we are now, and we may not realize just how frightened we are, but when we're in danger, when we sense danger, we are very much in the logical, conscious part of the brain. You know, we are alert for danger all the time. And we've had to shut down the dreaming part, the imaginative part, because it's too unsafe for us to be in that part of our head. Um, and it's actually why, especially at the beginning, we were all having such um, vivid dreams. It's because we were doing no daydreaming. Mm. Uh, we were very much in the facts all the time. And we were very much on the alert. Um, so that's why I couldn't write anything. I think it was for maybe the first five or six weeks, like nothing happened. Mm. And then, then it was like, I kind of because nothing was happening, we were in lockdown here. Life became very small and I was able to retreat into the world in my head. And, and it was not unpleasant at all. Like, in fact, it was probably more pleasant being in that world than in the real world. And then, very interesting, I hit another wall, maybe three months in, where suddenly I realized that none of the people in my book were being funny. The dialogue was gone to the dogs. And that was because, I wasn't seeing anyone. Mm -hmm. Now, I am very much a person where, like, if I'm invited to somebody's house for dinner and then they ring half an hour before the off and say that their child has measles and that it's all off, I'm like, oh, great, I don't have to go. You know, I'm very much an introvert. Like, I'm really an introvert. But I am craving people at the moment. Mm -hmm. I just want to go to a party. Like I want to go to a big noisy party where I kind of know loads of people not very well. And I want to move through the room and I want to stop and be friendly with everyone. And I want to have, you know, those gas conversations where people are like two glasses of wine in. Do you know, like people are in good form and they're talking, they're being funny. I just want that so badly. And I want to see people on the other side of the room and wave them say, I'll be over to you in a minute. You know, I just want one of those nights. And I really, I realized how much I need them. You know, yeah. nobody is telling me anything funny. And I've lost that, that facility for like lots of voices talking at the same time. Um, obviously key to, to writing a novel, isn't it? Because yeah. so many of your novels are about groups of people, especially the most recent one, Grown Ups, is an ensemble piece where we find out lots of people and they're often all together, aren't they? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the book I'm writing at the moment has a lot of characters as well. And as you say, a lot of characters together at the same time. Um, and yeah, you know that lovely energy that sparks in a room full of people when like people are feeding off the previous thing the person said. Mm. Like I'm not encountering any of that at the moment. Um, and, and it is affecting my work. Mm. And uh, that's a bit of a kind of a, a choker. Um, and it just means that I'm having to approach things differently. Um, it just means that it's harder to get into that place. Um, I think you're also kind of bringing to the fore there that, you know, when you're making work of any kind, trying to be creative, your mind and your circumstances will change. Your environment matters. And you have to kind of be prepared for it, it to change and alter and sort of, as you say, kind of roll with that. Yeah. I mean, the thing was like in the before times, like I used to, because I live in Ireland, but like most of my, a lot of my, yeah, I suppose most of my work is, is outside of Ireland um, and especially in the UK. And it meant that I was, I was traveling a fair bit and I used to always worry about those times because I used to speak, oh my God, you know, I, I never get a full day's work done when I'm when I'm traveling. But now I think those breaks are actually essential. Um, and I find it, I would find it really hard 
to say in the middle of the week, right, I'm taking Thursday off, I'm not doing anything. Mm. I would I would feel too kind of, too, you know, afraid that I would never, ever, you know, get out of bed again. But I think those breaks are no harm. It kind of lets work, I don't know, consolidate our ideas, yeah. marinate. It's still going on. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that is really, really important, I've discovered, is to have nothing in my head. I mean, what I mean is like, uh, you know, if I walk, it ne- I need to not be listening to a podcast. Mm. Um, you know, an empty head is a great way for ideas to come. I find it very hard. You know, uh, I just, I've never been, you know, it's never been something that I've been delighted about to kind of be alone with myself. But it, once I can get past the discomfort, a lot, a lot happens mm. in that emptiness. Um, but yeah, so those days off, you know, sometimes it's just nice to have time for things to happen. Yes. Behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah, they're, they're happening behind the scenes of your own, your own head in a way, aren't they? Um, yeah. Yeah interesting when we're kind of trying to be desperately in control and we think we should be I wondered if I could ask you a bit about the way that you've used those kind of feelings and the ideas that you have about the insides of all of our heads um, in your own work and I, I mean this is throughout your work you've written about life circumstances that can really throw a loop to people like divorce and depression you've also written about things like addiction and I, I'm thinking perhaps of your most recent novel um Grown Ups which I mean is a real hoot I mean there's lots in it that's really funny and the kind of family life that we all recognize arguments and split loyalties and terrible events that you have to go through there's a character in that book um who is who has an addiction um what interested me about her is that she's also brilliant at her job She's fantastic at her job and she's very much loved by the other members of the family. She's a kind of force for sort of bringing people together. And I thought that was such an interesting thing to contain in that character because she's going through these terrible times while presenting this incredible kind of face to the rest of the world. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about her and and how that relates to the rest of your work. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I mean... I never set out to write about emotional landscapes, but it's something that I seem to keep coming back to. Um, and like, I was always not normal. I, I know that's okay, that word is so, ugh. Um, I never felt like other people. I always felt like an oddball. And I always had far too many emotions and they were all the painful ones. Um, and other people seem to kind of have a buffer zone. You know, if, if their heart was broken, they were in bits for a while, but then it stopped. Whereas for me, the emotions just kind of ran and ran like a runaway train, you know, or like if something happened to me, it wouldn't just happen by itself. It would touch off a whole load of kind of previous wounds, you know, and I knew that I wasn't reacting like other people. And, and that, you know, when I found alcohol then in my teens, I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, this is the thing that is going to help me to cope. The, you know, I suddenly felt the way I thought everybody else felt. Mm. And, and then when I came into sobriety, I realized, I mean, and I'm so grateful not to be drinking, but that my feelings are still too many and too much. And it's, you know, I suppose, you know, and I sometimes look at people who just, who do it within the kind of, you know, normal, that's that word again, I shouldn't use that, kind of more constrained ways. They just feel things just the right amount, you know, and I would, sometimes I wish I'd be like them. But then I think there's an awful lot more like me than I, than I realized. I mean, until I started writing, I thought I was the most, excuse me, like effed up person on earth. But I realize now I'm not. And that there are a lot of people who feel as deeply as me or who are as thin skinned as I am or as sensitive as I am. Um, and that there are good points to it, like in that I, I can be empathetic. Um, and I suppose the other thing is, 
like I've lived through a lot at this stage, you know, like recovery from addiction and then a kind of a really, really, really bad spell of, uh, I mean, what do they call it? It's something acute depressive disorder, you know, and I'm still alive. So I feel like I can access those feelings. I can, I can write about them. I can offer them in my books and uh, and hopefully that it will help other people. And yeah, Cara in Grown Ups, thank you for being so nice about her. Yeah, she has bulimia, which I mean, any addiction is incredibly lonely um, because there's so much shame, there's secrecy in it. Like it, it has to be secret um, because uh, you know, you'd, you'd be obliged to stop if people knew about it. Um, and yeah, and she is like a really decent person. Yeah, you see, this is the thing about addiction. So I think addiction is much more widespread than than is kind of recognized. That like, I mean, I suppose we all have something that gets us through. Um, and in Kyra's case, it's it's a, you know it's a full blown addiction. It's it's dangerous for her. Um, but it doesn't mean that she's not a good person. Like addiction has no moral value. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of people still who think that addiction is a moral failing. It's not. Addiction is an illness and it's got nothing to do with upbringing or education or the goodness or not of a person. It's just an ailment, an illness, an illness that is horrible to live with. So, yeah. And I feel in a way like bulimia is quite widespread and it's not spoken about much. And it's it's probably one of the the addictions, I suppose, that can continue longest because you're not, what's the word? You don't manifest, you know, like with other addictions like anorexia or, or alcoholism, it's very hard to hide what's going on for you. But with bulimia, your weight is normal. Um, you know, your eating can appear normal. Um, and it's a loneliness that goes on for a long time for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd write about that. And, and I'm really glad that you felt that she's a, a well-rounded character because just because she's an addict doesn't mean that she's not helpful, and useful and kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I shan't give anything away for people who've, um, who haven't read the book yet. It is, as Mary said, it is gas. Um, <laughs> but she kind of gets the whole ball of the novel rolling so you know she's a good character to watch Marion just to, to go back to again something that you mentioned there you talked about writing um about your period of the period of depression you suffered a few years ago um again going back to that idea that you write about your addictions various issues um and that doesn't mean that it's never going to come again you know that doesn't mean that there won't life won't continue to develop time isn't static in that particular case your depression was really debilitating it really stopped you from from being able to carry on with your life as normal you did write about it afterwards and I wonder how that sort of changed your feelings about yourself as a writer oh my god yeah Alex like it was I mean it's still very hard to talk about because I had never been able to imagine feeling that strange and terrible um, I mean, it came really quite suddenly. Um, I think it was probably October 2009. And, and it very quickly became all normal life had to stop for me. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't depression the way it's, you know, depicted normally. Like it wasn't that awful flatness, that deadness, that no feeling. Or, or it wasn't the sorrow. I was in a state of kind of real fear, like real agitation, like, and I was in, like this was 11 years ago. So I was in the thick of a career, um, you know, and I, I did a lot of traveling, like I worked very hard, like I did a lot of book tours and everything stopped. It was like my life fell off a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, like I was due to go um, to the US on a book tour, like, you know, a month, in, in a month's time, that got cancelled. And then everything got cancelled mm. because, you know, I I ended up in hospital. Mm. And 
I couldn't, I mean, the idea of ever writing again was just, there was just no way it was going to happen. Like I was absolutely certain that it was just, that part of my life was over forever. And I had um, a contract with, um, with the, my publishers who are still my publishers now. And I was really, really afraid um, that I would get into trouble. And they had given me an advance and I wanted to give it back. Like I was like, I was like, please take it, please. You know, and they were like, are you mad? And I was like, yeah, I am actually. But like, they wouldn't take it. And it made me, I just couldn't understand why they wouldn't take it because I said, I'm absolutely certain about this. I won't be writing any more books. Um, so you must, and I had started a book um, called Sanctuary, as it happens. And, uh, and I abandoned that and that never, never got finished and never will be, I'm sure. Um, and for, I don't know, I mean, for like 18 months anyway, I was, I was suicidal for an awful lot of that time. And it was very, very, I just, I couldn't take the fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I couldn't. It was just horrific. And like, it was like, it felt as if something catastrophic had happened or was about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it was that level of kind of, kind of terror, I suppose. Um, and I know people couldn't understand because they were looking at my life from the outside and they was thinking, but look at her. Like she's written books and she has a house. And I mean, actually one journalist here in Ireland wrote that, you know, she said, what is Marion Keyes on about now? You know, she has a handsome husband. She has a good career and, um, and has, a, has a nice house. And, but my feelings didn't know any of that. Well, um, right. And, uh, but in between, I get a day here and a day there and I would try and write and I you know I ended up eventually writing um, a book called The Mystery of Mercy Close which is about a character I'd written about in earlier books but she suffers from the same kind of horrific illness that I did and it was actually it was really helpful and it's the only time I've ever used a novel as what's the word catharsis like it was so helpful to write my feelings I gave them to Helen you know um it was and I felt I thought it might be helpful to people mm -hmm. um you know I thought if people you know, and at the time I couldn't find anyone who felt like me you know but I have since um you know, because it wasn't, as I said earlier, it wasn't that people think of depression as a very flat, numb thing with maybe maybe some sorrow. You know, people kind of sitting by a, a rain drenched window with the tear coming down their face. Like that, that, that's the sort of image that's given. Uh, but th that kind of agitation, I couldn't find it at the time. That feeling, I felt very, very disconnected mm. from people. I felt very... Like I'd lost my place in the world. I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyway, yeah. So eventually, actually, I did write another book and it was about what I've gone through. And it isn't something that I'd be keen to repeat, to put it that way. But I suppose, and I mean, every now and then, like I just glance off those feelings again. and Oh, it's horrendous. But it's never really come back in the same way. And, uh, and like, I suppose, you know, that feeling of every day of waking up and feeling halfway normal, it's just so lovely. You know, the joy of that, you know, and the fact that I can sit here and talk to you about it, you know, that I have that much distance on it. Um, and I know that isn't what you asked me, but I would really say to anyone who is suffering with poor mental health, and who feels that they will never feel normal again, they'll never get, get better. I, that is exactly how I felt. I just felt like I was a goner. I was done for. And, and I, you know, I'm not going to do that thing of turning a negative into a positive because, you know, if I had a choice, I wouldn't have gone through it. But I think there's, it's easier for me to feel joyous these days. 
because I suppose the contrast is so great. And also, I mean, I've cha I changed my life. Like I don't work anything like as hard um, mm -hmm. as I used to. You know, I, I don't, I mean, even before the pandemic, I only, you know, I didn't travel the same way. I did and nothing like as much. And I kind of only say yes to the things that I feel will be fun or useful or that I'll enjoy. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's the way I have to live now, but it's also, it's a way that is much more comfortable. It, it's just a lot, lot easier to yeah, live yeah. this way. There is no, I mean, there are really important things to learn from a situation like that or similar situations about what you yourself, what you can demand of yourself, what you, how you can best sort of keep yourself in a kind of safe and healthy state. Um, but Marion, I do want to say thank you so much for answering that question. We chatted a bit beforehand and we knew that we would talk about these things and we've talked about them often, but it shouldn't go unremarked that, you know, you do talk about these things with amazing kind of candor and it is really helpful to things but it is a it's a big thing for you to do and, and we're very grateful for it indeed um it's you know i'm sure it's you know it, it it takes a lot of courage to do that um i'm aware that i really have to take some of these questions not have to i'd like to because they're fabulous questions um i i mean i'm just i'm just gonna get get to this one quite quickly somebody says do you think you could help them get into Strictly this year <laughs> do you mean as a dancer or in the audience um, <laughs> ah no I think I you see I read as a dancer and now I think they actually mean I can't get into Strictly like I can't get I thought you I'm sorry ah. who's asked this question I'm very sorry I thought you meant you actually wanted to go on it and I thought well even Marion powerful as she is may not be able to make that happen but how'd you get infused with it well it is in starting properly until this coming Saturday yeah um yeah. so yeah. you know up to now we've been fobbed off with best of so I'm actually really quite excited about Saturday you know, I think we haven't had any of the usual, you know, the dancers meeting their partner reveals and all of that. So I think once we see them all up, up and running, I feel, I feel the magic will happen. Yes. Keep the yes. faith. Keep the faith. Keep, keep going. Don't expect to sort of absolutely love it right from the get go. Also that, that, uh, that questioner says, and I agree, I'll echo this, that picture behind you is absolutely lovely. Um, and Not a real one I Real era, lovely big flowers, lovely big colourful flowers. Um, our next questioner says um, that they love your short films, uh, the Marion Keyes' world films, and uh, they brought him or her great comfort um, and during kind of spells of not feeling so great. Um, have you got any tips for being creative? And this is the questioner's word, where you're, when you're mad in the head, what, what are your tips for sort of pushing on through? I mean, you've kind of answered the, the question. You just have to keep trying. I mean, even today, like um, I have to make a bargain with myself every morning that I will write for an hour, you know, uh, which sounds like nothing, but it feels like enormous when I'm starting the hour. And um, whenever anything is hard, I break it down into manageable pieces. So like 10 minutes, you know, if you really feel like an hour is too much, Ask yourself to do 10 minutes. And after the 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. Anything difficult, no matter what, if it's broken down into pieces small enough, I found that I can, I can make a run at it. Um, I hope that helps. Keep everything small. Don't ever look at the horizon. Keep it right now what's in front of you. I yeah. really wish you well. Yeah. I wonder if this is something you've ever tried. It's a tip that somebody gave me recently and I'm just I'm just repeating it because I think it might be useful for some people. If, say, writing is the thing that you're trying to do and it just feels impossible, perhaps because what you're trying to write about is a bit difficult for you, you can just speak it into your phone or something like that. You can tell a story in a different way at that moment that might feel a bit easier. Is that something you've ever tried to do, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that thing of speaking it into your phone is just such a great idea because you're not kind of trying to make everything fit into perfect sentences, but what you're doing is conveying the essence. 
and and a tumble of stuff comes out um and there's always going to be nuggets of great words in that kind of messy tumble just mm. like just do it all what I do is I just blah onto the page a lot of the time I think I'm not going to you know I'm not going to try and make it make sense I'm going to repeat things I'm going to skip things you know but just to try and convey all the things that are here I suppose and then then you can go about sifting and mm. and see but yeah the idea of sometimes it's just quicker to talk it um, I think if you try and type it, it can slow your head down and you're, and you're driving to a wall. Yeah, just let, let it all come out in whatever way without judgment yeah. and then come back and work on it. Exactly, whatever the best way to do it. Now, this is kind of related. Someone else says, and it's a great question. Being authentic is hard. Does it happen kind of by accident? Have you got any tips for, and I, I know exactly what that questioner means because the minute you kind of think, it must be authentic. It kind of stops you being authentic, doesn't it? I, I don't know. Um, I'm. I think I'm. I'm cursed with no boundaries. Um, you know. I know I am. Like it. I mean. Like it has caused me issues. Uh, um, being authentic. I think. I suppose you just have to keep having that conversation with yourself and saying, "Do I mean that? What I've just written." you know, yeah, or yeah. am I only saying it because I think other people will find it, you know, and I think, I suppose, being authentic means being vulnerable, you know, it means running the risk of people going, what's wrong with you, or do you know, of being judged, um, I suppose maybe then you have to feel safe in order, in order to feel authentic, to be authentic, because I mean, the only time, the only reason that we're not authentic all the time is because we are trying to navigate ourselves to a world that's judgmental and that wants us to be different to the way we actually are. So I suppose having that conversation with yourself where you say, I owe it to myself. Yeah. To be honest and to be truthful. Um, and especially when it comes to your work, pretend that nobody else is going to read it. Uh, that is great help. Just mm -hmm. pretend you're doing it just for yourself. Not, even you aren't going to read it. And then once it's kind of removed from any possibility of being judged, I think it makes it a lot easier. But it's our vulnerability that stops us from being authentic. Mm, that's right. Um, here's a question about, about a specific book. Um, uh, somebody who enjoyed The Break, uh, which was your novel before growing up. Was, yeah. Um, and uh, they're wondering what your inspiration was. And this is a novel about kind of, it, it sort of does what it says on the tin. It's about a couple kind of breaking up or considering breaking up. Yeah, they've been together for 18 years and they're in their mid forties. The inspiration was because I, I, it, it, it happens. Uh, what, what happens is your man wants to leave for six months. He just, he wants a break. You know, he wants to go off and be a single man for six months, but then he wants to come back and be married again. But it is actually happening. And it's because we're all living so much longer. Um, and, you know, and especially like in places like the West Coast of America, and, and people are doing this, taking a break because they are committed to their partner. They're committed to monogamy, but they're not going to drop dead at 55 anymore. They're kind of looking at going all the way through to, you know, 100, 110, and they're not sure that they can do monogamy for that long. They want a bit of, what would you call it? Interruption. So <laughs> it, yeah, it was that, you know, and, and I read, I mean, Jesus, I read a book, one book called The Wild Oats Project. I mean, like I'm such a sap, like I'm all about, everybody must be in love forever and there nothing bad things can happen, you know, but of course life isn't like that. So it was based on the fact that it is actually happening for real, but I don't approve. You don't approve, no, you're saying no, no. Well, I think that there's that thing, isn't it, about you can't step into the same river twice. So if you do do it, your marriage is not gonna be the same or your relationship when you come back. We should, you know, that much at least is clear. Um, we are nearly out of time, but there is a, a questioner here who kind of chimes with something I, you know, I quite like to ask you. Uh, and I'm just going to going to find what they say. They say, how can we keep up with the amazing work you do other than reading your books? And just to say again, I mean, you do 
so much that is that is sort of very directly helpful to people you talk about i mean we both live in ireland and you talk a lot about the political situation social situation here it goes into your books too but you're also ever so kind of interactive with people on twitter and social media in various ways which i think is very important to you so i kind of wonder if you could just say a bit about the other things that you're doing and and what you're up to next Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram and I do have a website. Um, I sometimes write newsletters, although I haven't since the pandemic started because I just, because I haven't felt that there's anything to say. And likewise, I, I used to do a short film every Monday. And again, I have nothing to offer at the moment. You know, the well is empty, uh, but I hope that I will start them again. I mean, I suppose... Um, yeah, the, the website really will kind of let you know, you know, if I'm doing any, any, any of these yokes, you know, any of the Zoom things. Um, and I, I also wonder whether you would ever consider having a podcast and I wonder hosting oh, your own podcast. Oh, my God. You see, I mean, oh, I find it really hard to interview people. I find it. I I'm no good at it. Like I'm grand answering questions, but I don't think I could have people on every week. And, and I, I'm no good at kind of getting people to drawing them out. You know, uh, I would, I wouldn't mind if it was just me or you and me, Alex. Do you know what I mean? Or, yeah. A, a, a conversation is yeah. fine, but having guests on and saying, mm. tell me about the blah, blah, blah. I, I just, no, I'm, I'm too Alan Partridgey. I mean, I, I make myself cringe even at the thought. Well, you're not, Alan Partridge. I'm going to stop that right there. Okay, okay. Not Alan Partridge. Um, you, you talked about, uh, just, just very finally, and before we welcome um, Lucy back uh, to finish up the session for us, but um, you mentioned that you are working on a novel, and I know in the past you've said, and I think this will please anybody who doesn't know this, you are uh, going to be going back uh, to some of your previous characters whom we have loved. Is that what you're working on at the minute? It is. Yeah, it's the first time I've ever written a sequel. Um, I've written about the five Walsh sisters in various books, but they're all standalone. This is a literal sequel to Rachel's Holiday um, that I am trying to write. And it's a book that has been, I, I don't know, it has touched a lot of people because it's about a young woman who uh, who, who gets clean and a lot of people have kind of got a lot of comfort or identification from it. And I feel like there, there's a real onus on me to do this book justice. So I am honest, you know, I am, it is, it is a heavy, uh, um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's very nice to be meeting those characters again, but I am, I am taking this very, very seriously. Marion, um, you've got to turn the onus into a bonus. Oh, nice! Yeah, that's <laughs> episode one of your podcast about this about this book. Um, yeah, Marion, it's as ever been so delightful um, to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And I'm just gonna gonna hand back to Lucy now, who's gonna gonna chat to us for a minute. Thank you so. Thank much. you, Alex. I love you. Thank you too. Oh my word, that was amazing. Honestly, Alex, Marianne, thank you so much. And also, I love the fact that Marianne said you're not very good at asking questions, but you two as a combination, I couldn't agree more. It was <laughs> such a beautiful conversation where the, all of these kind of vulnerabilities imbued in wisdom just came out. And I know that there was quite a few comments, people just saying this is an amazing Zoom chat. Thank you so much. Thank you for talking about depression. And I think for talking about catastrophizing things, I know, Marion, that lots of what you said has chimed with so many people. And honestly, thank you so much for me personally, but also everyone who's been here for just being so open and authentically sharing who you are and how you how you've lived your life and how you live your days it's been really so enriching and so encouraging I'm full of hope yeah for, it, was, it felt like it was a really hopeful conversation I just want to revisit one little quote which I love what did you say they would never have grown if you hadn't loved them I know <laughs> you said I'm quite nearly about I'm gardening and I think me. Matt I'm yeah, taking and I'm take it with me back to the veg yeah. patch <laughs> all sorts of areas of my life and like if you love it it grows and I think but yeah thank you both you're in, um, amazing women both you. it's been such an honor to 
spend the afternoon with you. And for all of those who've joined us this afternoon, whether you're in a hospital ward, in an office, in your front room, in your teeny tiny messy little spare bedroom like me, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being part of this conversation. These conversations are with you, for you. It really is about community and coming together for that fellowship. So thank you for giving your time and being here and especially those who, who popped in some questions. So, so sorry we didn't manage to get quite all of them, but yeah, thank you for engaging so dynamically. Um, so all that's left to say, apart from this big heartfelt thanks to everyone involved, um, is that there is more stuff coming up on the Make For Tomorrow programme and we would love it if you would join us. Do go to the Make Your Mark website where we're updating with information all the time. Next week we've got an amazing visual arts project starting with uh, the fabulous artist Mark Titchener. Um, it's all about self-portraiture but self-portraiture together so which is I think a really interesting concept and he is just great so do take a look and sign up if you're interested and then we also have um, the wonderful image and stubs in conversation next week as well so please Go and have a look, follow us on social media if that's your thing. Um, but yeah, do take take a look at the website and please, please continue to join us. We, we love to have you here. Um, and finally, I just wanna say a huge thank you to our funders. So the brilliant Trust Charity Heads On um, fundraise to make Make For Tomorrow happen. Um, so big thumbs up to them and thank you to the Arts Council England and NHS Charities together who have contributed financially to, so that we can put all these digital events on. Um, but yeah, do please keep coming back. And I think that's it from us here. Thank you again, thank you again, Marianne. Thank, thank you again, you. Alex. Thank you and for having us. Thanks. Thank you. It was all of you. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you so much.